And now on the line is Sherry McDay, the Director of Mental Health Reform. Sherry, welcome to the programme. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on the programme, Dan. Okay, that's great. Uh, Sherry, I, inter- I interviewed you for the last time in 2016 about the budget for 2017. Uh, could you tell me if there has been any big positive news with your work since then? Well, I suppose we got some commitment to funding for mental health in the budget for this year. Um, it was about... 15 million additional from what was expected. Um, but importantly, uh, when the budget came out in October of last year, the Minister for Mental Health and the Minister for Mental Health committed to providing an additional 55 million in the budget for mental health for 2019. Um, and so that's what we're campaigning mm-hmm. about at the moment to make sure that the government keeps that commitment. Uh, and a little bit more, more, a li- much more, uh, because we feel actually when you put it in context that 55 million is not going to be enough to mm. give us the mental health services that we need. So we've asked the government for 105 million additional investment next year, very specifically to improve the services, uh, to bring on stream more staff that are available to meet uh, more people who who are coming forward for help, and to uh, about fifty million to deal with the underlying funding gap that's been hidden in the mental health services over the past few years. Hmm. And the question that, that goes to the core of the provision of mental health services in Ireland: uh, How is the recruitment of more mental health staff going? Do you know? Well, uh, from what we've heard from the HSE in public statements and in their presentations to the Oireachtas, um, they are finding it very challenging to recruit the mental health professionals where they have vacant posts in, in the HSE's mental health services. So mm-hmm. this is a very difficult uh, issue uh, because, as we know, mental health is a people business. Mm. It takes people being there to support anyone who's going through a difficult time. And uh, they need to uh, be skilled in various um, you know, therapies and in assessment and in prescribing. And uh, so they need to have good qualifications so that we can be confident that they have the skills to give us, give us the help that we need. So uh, we, can't, yeah. we can't have good mental health services without people to deliver them. And I've heard from a couple of people, um, friends of mine who attend mental health services in the public health system, outpatients, that the staff are regularly being changed, the psychiatrists and even other staff as well. Like, there doesn't seem to be much kind of continuity. and I think it's very unsettling for people if, if they're seeing a different doctor every time they go down. You know what I mean? Is that happening yeah. across the board or just some places or what's the story, do you know? Well, I, I don't think it's happening for everybody. Mm. Um, and we, we've just completed a national survey of people's experience of the mental health services. And while we haven't got published information on that yet, my sense from what I'm hearing about that survey is that some people have had that negative experience, mm. but it's not across the board. Okay. Um, and that in some cases, when people change psychiatrists, they actually feel they get a better service. And then mm. in other times when they change psychiatrists, they feel it, it negatively impacts on their on their relationship and their therapy and their, their treatment. So mm. I, I can certainly appreciate it. It's something that has been raised for many years about this problem, and it, it should really be designed, the, the system should be designed around what's best for the person with a mental health difficulty, mm. not what's best for the services in terms of, you know, training professionals or whatever reasons that the services have for sh- for moving psychiatrists around. Mm. You know, the, the, it should be based around what suits the, the person who is in their receiving support. Uh, and we don't have that system at the moment, but that's the way it should change. Yeah, I I don't let to go on to the next issue. I don't know for sure about um probably over forty years or more ago because I'm in my late thirties. But over the last twenty years and in particular the last ten years, I've heard a lot of talk about reducing the stigma that goes with mental health. You know, 
b b before we talk about that stigma, can you tell me if there are any other big issues within the health system apart from funding that need to be addressed? Well, certainly, I think what we really need is much more of an emphasis on early intervention mm -hmm. and ensuring that uh, people who uh, first develop concerns about their mental health can get easy access. I mean, in general, there's a big problem with people being able to access the support mm -hmm. when they need it, where they need it. And it's really on both ends of the spectrum. So when people first have a difficulty, instead of it being very easy for them to go and see a psychologist or psychotherapist or um, their GP, they may have to pay for it, and that might be a barrier for them getting the help that they need, um, which makes no sense because the earlier you get help, the less likely it is to develop into a more enduring difficulty. Mm. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, we still have a difficulty where people are not able to get support when they're really at their end of their tether, when they really are struggling, are in crisis, um, and, and need urgent support. They still oftentimes have to go to an emergency department uh, and wait a, a long time before they get to see um, someone who is a specialist in mental health. So we want to see that addressed. We do think funding's part of the issue, but it's also about um, expanding our services and expanding access to those services mm. and having new ways of working in those services. And a couple of other things. You're calling for, for the last few years, you've been calling for uh, mental health services 24-7, aren't you, on the weekends as well? That's it, exactly. So um, we have had an out-of-hours access campaign over the last few years, and this year we got a commitment from the minister to make sure that all the adult services are operating at least seven days a week. Mm -hmm. We're watching that commitment carefully to see if it's delivered. I don't think it's implemented yet, but recruitment has been underway mm -hmm. to be able to deliver that. Um, and then the next step that we feel is very important is to make sure that child and adolescent mental health services are available seven days a week as well uh, in people's communities. So uh, we, we will be ramping up on asking the minister for that over the coming months once we get through the budget. And uh, so I'd encourage anyone who cares about those issues, about the funding, about out-of-hours access, about um, more early intervention supports, um, and about people's rights when they're in services to uh, keep in touch with us, to connect with our Facebook page, with our Twitter feed, and log on to the website regularly and um, connect in with, with our newsletter, and you'll be able to be part of uh, our campaigns for getting all of those reforms into our mental health services. Mm -hmm. I just have two or three more questions, sorry. Um, you mentioned adult mental health and children. Uh, children's mental health services, they're even, in the, they're even worse than adult mental health services. Like There's a huge demand for them uh, that's not being met. Is that true, is it? Yes. Uh, I think the latest news uh, we were just reading was of a waiting list of 2,700 mm -hmm. children waiting for an assessment mm. uh, by a specialist in child and adolescent mental health services. Mm. And over 300 of those children having waited over a year. Mm. So that's very bad. That just mm. goes against good practice in terms of early intervention. Um, it increases families' distress. Uh, it it uh, slows down the recovery for those children and may hinder them in terms of their education. Uh, it's uh, it's not acceptable, and it's been going on for too many years now that we talk about this waiting list for child and adolescent mental health services. So we really need an urgent, direct action plan to address the waiting list in child and adolescent mental health services and make it much shorter time frame before children get the help they need. And you also have the issue of uh, children being admitted to inpatient psychi adult psychiatric hospitals. That still happens occasionally, is it, yeah? 
Yes, I don't have the figures to hand in terms of how many children this year, but I think there were still dozens of children who ended up being admitted to adult uh, inpatient units because a suitable place in a child and adolescent inpatient unit was not available. Hmm. So um, that's that's a, a in contravention of that child's human right to age appropriate mental health treatment. And we know that some children do find it very distressing to be in an adult mm. inpatient unit. So um, it's it's again it's it's not acceptable. It's fundamental in terms of people's human rights, and it needs to be it needs to be dealt with uh, once and for all in terms yeah. of ensuring that no child who would be appropriately placed in a child and adolescent unit is ending up in an adult unit. The Mental Health Commission um, issued a report a few months ago uh, slating mental health services in Ireland. Are you, were you involved with that report as well? Well, no, we're, we're separate from the Mental Health Commission, oh, yeah. so that report would have been prepared uh, on foot of the inspectors, inspections of the services throughout the 2017 and then the commission issues their annual report that sets out their findings and their other activities uh, as well as the inspector's annual report. Do you want to just say something on that report? Do you have anything to say about it? Well, I, I think that report underscores what we've been saying for a number of years, which is that the mental health services are not in a state that we can feel confident mm. that people are getting the care that they need, when they need it, where they need it, and of a quality that is a, that is of a standard we would expect for any other part of the health service. Mm. And uh, the, the Mental Health Commission very concerningly spoke about the risk of abuse in residential settings mm. that the inspector had looked at over the year. And I think that we need to be very, very concerned that there is no current statutory inspection regime for our community-based mental health services mm. and no statutory regulations about our community-based mental health services. Mm. And I think that that goes to the heart of why we cannot wait any longer for the reform of our mental health legislation, which is now three years waiting hmm. and uh, we we it's it's high time that we got publication of the reforming legislation to empower our mental health commission to inspect and regulate the community-based mental health services that thousands of people are using every year is this new mental health bill is this planned to be uh, brought forward over the next dull term do you know well there's no definite date for publication of the bill. Mm. The government has indicated that they're, they expect to have made substantial progress on drafting the text by the end of the year, mm. uh, but they said that last year, so we are very anxious to, to actually see that come to fruition this year. Okay, just two more questions, Shari. Uh, I'm a big supporter of the public health alcohol bill coming into force, you know. Uh, it ex it's, it's expected to be passed in the, in the Oireachtas very soon. Do you see this act as going to have a positive effect or affect on our nation's, our nation's mental health also? Yes, we're very supportive of the public alcohol uh, health alcohol bill. We're members of the uh, Alcohol Action Ireland, and we are uh, members because we know that alcohol is a factor in half of all suicides in Ireland and is also uh, a factor in over a third of cases of deliberate self-harm. So there's no doubt that uh, alcohol is exacerbating people's mental health difficulties, their mental distress, and can lead to uh, very poor outcomes for people with mental health difficulties. So we do hope that that bill will pass and that it will be part of the, uh, the elements of a, of a public health system that will uh, foster the best possible outcome for people with mental health difficulties. Mm. Uh, indeed, I believe the 
to build it when it becomes an act it's not only going to have a positive effect on, on our nation's mental health but it will inspire many other people in other countries around the world to bring in similar legislation you know um last question sherry uh, to finish up uh, do you want to say something about on stigma of having a mental illness or mental health problems there's been a lot of talk for i, I think things are getting better in this regard what's your impression of it well, I think it's very encouraging the freedom with which people with mental health difficulties are talking on the public airwaves like this radio mm. station and other radio stations and in social media uh, about their experience of mental health difficulties. I think it's very positive. I think we have to make sure that we're making it as easy for someone with a diagnosis of schizophrenia to talk freely about their experience mm -hmm. as we are uh, someone who has anxiety or depression. They, it's just as true for people with have a diagnosis of psychosis or schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder or bipolar disorder that they deserve to be able to live with dignity and respect and equality in Irish society and pursue all their aspirations and uh, be comfortable with um, expressing who they really are. And so I think we need to remember that and ensure that we are supporting people across the spectrum of mental health difficulties to speak up and share their stories and affirm that it's a, it's a totally acceptable part of human existence and, and, and our uh, part of, part of being, being a human being.